you ever heard your heart beat in your ear? In medical terms, we call that pulsatile tinnitus. Yesterday I pronounced it tinnitus and a bunch of you got mad, but there are always two different ways of saying it. No matter how you say it, let's talk about it. So yesterday I presented the case of a 50 year old guy who came to my office with pulsatile tinnitus. Not only did he feel his heartbeat in his ears, whenever he spoke, his voice sounded like really loud. When other people spoke, it wasn't that loud to him, but when he spoke, he almost had to whisper because it was so audible. He's noticed these symptoms for about five years. He brought them to the attention of his doctor and had an MRI of his brain done a few years ago that was normal. But the symptoms haven't gotten better and it's driving him crazy. His medical history is actually pretty benign. He's very healthy, except that he had a pretty bad concussion about five years ago in an ATV accident. Anytime he coughed, sneezed, or lift something heavy, he got vertigo. And honestly, that was pretty annoying to him because he wanted to lift weights, but anytime he strained when he lifts something heavy, he would get pretty bad vertigo. He also felt like he was having a hard time hearing, so a physical examination was done, including the Weber and Rene test. Is it Rene or Rene test? I'll let you guys let me know in the comments section. His Weber test was normal, but when they did the Rene test, his bone conduction was longer than air conduction, which means he has a conductive hearing loss. This is a really quick bedside test that we can do, but he was sent for formal audiology studies that confirmed a conductive hearing loss. What does that mean? To understand hearing, we need to understand the anatomy of the ear, and it's really kind of complicated. You have the ear canal, and then the sound transmits to the tympanic membrane, or your eardrum. Then the sound waves get transmitted to these little bones called the ossicle, the malleolus incus, and stapes to be exact. The sound waves are transmitted to our cochlea, which I think kind of looks like a snail, fluid-filled cavity within the inner ear that mostly works on hearing, transmitted to our semicircular canals, and it's kind of like three hula hoops. The primary job is to translate balance and head position. Semicircular canals will then relay its information to the vestibular nerve, the balance nerve, Cochlea relays its signal to the cochlear nerve or the hearing nerve. Stibulocochlear nerve is cranial nerve number eight. That's why it's an important nerve to relay balance and hearing information to the brain. If there's any disruption in the conduction of the inner ear, you'll get a conductive hearing loss. So what is causing his conductive hearing loss? That's when you get a CAT scan or advanced imaging to help figure it out. Because there's something going on in there that's garbling up the information so it can't get to the brain appropriately. This is actually a CT of the temporal bone, which is this part of our bone where all of these structures are housed. And this area right here is the semicircular canal and the arrow is pointing to a dehiscence of the semicircular canal. Here's another look at another person's scan. He has what's called superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Normally there should be bone overlying the superior semicircular canal, but in a dehiscence, that bone is missing. Fluid doesn't circulate appropriately in the inner ear. I know most of you guys have used hula hoops as a kid, so let's relate hula hoops to the semicircular canals help tell our brain where we're balanced in space and where our head position is. So if we move our head around, up and down, back and forth, fluid moves around inside of these canals like the movement inside of a hula hoop. As the hula hoop rotates, the fluid will lag because of inertia. When the fluid moves, our brain knows that our head is moving. Does that make sense? Normally there is bone overlying the superior semicircular canal. Fluid waves are pretty predictable. If there's an opening in the semicircular canal, like a dehiscence, you can have pressure from the brain that actually pulsates on this inner ear and gives us distorted signals. Our brain doesn't understand what's going on. You can see how that may interrupt the signals that are normally there and cause us to feel off balance and even a little dizzy. The pulsations of the heartbeat within our brain will make us hear the heartbeat in our ear. There are certainly many other causes for pulsatile tinnitus, so this is only one of those rare causes. That's great and all, but how does this even happen? It's thought that some people naturally are born with a very thin bone overlying that part of our semicircular canal. Like Lady Gaga says, you're born this way. That thin area of bone may thin even more as you get older. After all, when we age, our bones do thin. Other provoking factors may be something like a trauma, like in our patient, or even infection that may cause that canal to open up. When the fluid pathways in your ear get messed up, you have balance troubles, dizziness, tinnitus, 
and even trouble with your hearing. A review of the data suggests that it's more common in men and the average age is around 50. There are some studies that show that up to 2% of the population could have imaging findings consistent with the distance of the semicircular canals. Important to match up the symptoms with the radiology findings. Now, most people can be treated conservatively and can deal with their symptoms, but if the symptoms are bad enough, surgery may be indicated. There's a couple of different neurosurgical procedures in which we can plug the hole of the defect. The middle fossa approach is where we make a craniotomy and get to the inner ear by going around the brain. It's usually done by an ENT specialist as well as a neurosurgeon. A transmastoid approach is another approach where we can go in and plug the ear where you don't even go near the brain and you go through the mastoid and there's different risks associated with each approach. This is showing the plugging approach and then there is another approach where you can actually resurface the top of the bone. Once our patient was diagnosed, he was sent on to a specialist, had the surgery, and did great after the surgery where he had complete resolution of his symptoms within three months. The anatomy of our ear is super cool and I barely touched the surface. It's literally crazy to me how many different things can go wrong in our body. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.